Um, so this is the plan. And uh, the lectures will be recorded, so in case you want to come back to it, you, of course, can. But the idea is that you're here and that you try to understand what this thing is about and ask questions and uh, yeah that's it because i don't believe that i can make you like this or dislike this i mean i'm offering if you find it useful in your life you will learn how to appreciate it if not still okay you were here you were exposed to some ideas that maybe you knew or didn't know so i hope i'm i'm fine with that so i want to start very very early it's not that I'm now making you a grand scheme of things, you know, starting from dinosaurs and then developing to today. But I would like to start like on some very basic ideas that are important uh, for us today. I call it origins of rational thought or how we rationalize the world around us. And uh, before 19th century, which changed a lot of things. So for a very long time, we have considered two fields of knowledge to be kind of pillars of stability of our rational world. And on one side, we had logic. On the other side, you had geometry. And we thought of geometry not only as kind of, and, and we thought about logic and geometry not only as a theory, but also something that is really intimately linked with the world around us, with, our, with how we uh, think about reality. And these, uh, two fields, logic and geometry, they have two very important references. In logic, we have Aristotle's laws of reasoning. What do they teach us? They kind of show us how to operate with words and with sentences to create an argument. For example, if we place the subject and the predicate within a sentence in a certain way, if you just put them together in a certain way, and then put sentences in a certain way, in a certain order, uh, what you can achieve is that you start, for example, with a sentence that is true and add another sentence which will make sure that the conclusion you make is also true. So look, let's look at this example on the left. If the first two sentences, which are called premises, if they are true, then this, the third one, which is called a the conclusion, then conclusion must automatically be true. Just by follow, following this form, this construction, which is called a syllogism. We will uh, examine this a little bit uh, more later, but we can think of, about this as a kind of architectonics of argumentation. Now let's look at the right side. So in geometry, we have something which is called Euclid's axiomatic system. And what is this thing about? Well, it's a system of thought which postulates kind of certain propositions and here you see the five most important propositions or, or the axioms. And from these five sentences on the right, Euclid derived all the truths of geometry. So these five premises on the right, they guarantee that any theorem that we derive from them must be true. And this is a little bit crazy. Because for a long time, this system seemed perfect, but what was unsettling is that this kind of fifth sentence over there appeared to be very, very strange. So you can kind of think that a straight line segment can be drawn joining any two points. You can kind of imagine that this might be true if you look at it from a non-mathematical standpoint, not, not modern, modern uh, mathematical standpoint. But this last sentence, if two lines are drawn which intersect a third in such a way that the sum of the inner angles of one side is less than two right angles, then the two lines inevitably must intersect uh, each other on that side if extended far enough. This is so-called the parallels axiom, that two lines, parallel lines, will never meet. They will meet only in infinity, which is practically impossible. The problem with that is that you could not prove that. It was not self-evident that this will happen. Somehow, you must include it in your system to make everything true. Without it, everything falls apart, but this thing, you cannot prove that it's true or not. And th but this knowledge, in principle, these two things, was a very, very powerful knowledge. So 
Now we go to 19th century and you have so much knowledge, but it's not organized at all. It lacks any kind of systematization. And you, you look at these things, they're so simple and so powerful. And you can derive all the truths, all the known truths, logical and geometrical truths from them. So what happened in 19th century is that all these fields wished to have foundations just like that, simple foundations from which you can derive all the truths. And this was the goal of 19th century. This is what in 19th century uh, all the scientists and mathematicians and theoreticians tried to do. And this was especially, an especially important thing here was that if you are able to ground numbers in a, certain, in, in a similar way. Why? Because on, on top of arithmetic, you can build more and more complex mathematics, and then you can build a mathematical system which will be all clean and perfect, and you could derive all the truths of the world. So this was the kind of idea what people were striving in the 19th century. And now look, let's look about what, what logic is, how logic describes our world, what, what is it about? I'm gonna not be incredibly strict uh, with this because there are many logics and I don't want to go historically through them. I want to introduce you the important concepts. But let's start with like classic logic. So Aristotle, uh, you know him, he introduced an idea, a tool called an organon. And this tool can be used to argue in a convincing way. So what he does, how he makes this thing, he discusses the types of sentences that you can make and what is common to all of these types of sentences that we can make. For example, he realized that um, all of these sentences are kind of saying that some things are of a certain kind. For example, we can talk about objects, for example, Socrates, or more abstract collection of objects, for example, every man, or some man. So these figures he called the subject. And then the thing we say about the subject, he calls it a predicate. And then what he noticed is that the truth of some simple sentences, which only have subject and predicate, has an effect of the truthfulness or of other such sentences, which also have subject and predicate. So to show what he, what he meant, he ordered these sentences in a particular way to see these relations. So let's examine what, what we have here. So what we can say about, for example, sentences one and two on the top. So all men are mortal and all men are not mortal. So if you take them together, they cannot be true at the same time. So men, all men are either mortal or not mortal. So they cannot be true at the same time. Then let's see these diagonal sentences. For example, all men are mortal and some men are not mortal. So what he realized is they are kind of contradictory things. So if one is true, the other must be false and vice versa. And it's the same for these other diagonal sta statements two and three. And uh, now it's interesting to compare, for example, these uh, vertical lines and their relations. For example, one, all men are mortal, it is more general than number three, which is some men are mortal. Because if one is true, if all men are mortal, then it's also true that some men are mortal, but not vice versa. If we say some men are mortal, this does not guarantee that all men are mortal. So he was very interested in, in, in these kind of diagrams. And uh, from that, what followed is this construction, which is called a syllogism. So if you, idea is you put certain sentences of a certain kind in a certain order. So first sentence says something about men. It says all men are mortal. So notice these things which I put in different colors. So then if the subject of the first sentence, which is men, becomes a predicate of the second sentence, you see in the number two, the red one is also men, but now it's a predicate. And then if we make a third sentence, which has the same subject and the second and, and the same predicate as the first, then the third sentence will always be true. So if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then Socrates is mortal. This is the conclusion. And this will always be true. In, it doesn't ma matter what is the subject or what is the predicate. This construction makes it true, not the world. This construction makes it true. And somehow, it seems to be that we also think like that about the world. 
So this was very crazy. So you could not really decouple our reasoning about the world and what happens around us with the models of the world such as logic. And now I'm going to in very simple terms and I will build up on them. But for me, it's important to, to start with very simple ideas. As you will see, that they are still the crucial ones. And now let's go to the future before we go further with logic. And let's review one of the most important constructions uh, in algebra, which we call an equation. So on the top, you have an equation. And I, will, I want to show you that this equation is kind of similar to what to when we say Socrates is a man. So let's see why. So if, what does this equation say? It says that what we have on the left side of the equation over there is equal or is the same what we have on the right. Yeah. So a good way to represent this, what this formality means, is to use this analogy, for example, of scales. And as we know, scales will be in balance only if we have both things weight weight the same. Yeah. So if we take this equa uh, this equation on the top and we put it on, put extract the numbers and put it on the scales, what happens? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I now took these numbers on the left side three, on the right seven, and put it on the scale. Will this scale be in balance now? No, because obviously you have something more uh, which has more weight on the right and less uh, weight on the left. Therefore, this is not this is not an equation. In order to be an equation, you have to have two sides similar. But we are missing two x's here. So let's put one x and two x's. So now we have two sentences, two, uh, two weights on the left and the right. And what equation says is whatever happens, these things must be in balance. Your goal is to make them in balance. You need to determine x's so that these two things are in balance, yeah? And from this, and then you can include one more thing. So now you can think about this. What can we do now? What we know is that if we remove one from the other side and one from the other side, they will still be in balance, yeah? Because we took the same weight from one side and from the other side, and they will still keep in balance. So. Equality will not change if we add or subtract the same thing on both sides. So then let's remove the ones until we are only left with x's. So watch what happens. Now we have two x's on the left side and four on the right side. So now equation in formula would be 2x equals 4. And now because you know that two objects and four objects correspond to each other, then you can remove one x and two ones. This is simply means divide the equation by two. We divide it by two and we get x, x equals two. x equals two says the same truth as this thing here. It's the same thing. Yeah? Why? Because it makes it in balance. So why am I telling you this? It's because logicians realized that you can do the same in logic. But before that, let me show you one more example. And this is also a simple example. It's now instead of one uh, equation, you have two equations, like a system of equations. Do you know how to solve this thing? How would you solve this? Any volunteer just to tell me what to do? But what would be my next step here, for example? What would be the easiest thing to do? It's the same as there. OK, well, that's doable, you wanted to say? Um, add yes, that's the easiest way. You can add, just add them. Yeah? So 3x plus x is 4x. This plus y2 and my minus y2 will cancel each other, equals 12. So x equals 3. Simple. And now I find y, yeah? But why can I add them? 
That's the question. How come you have these two things? Why can I add them? This is what you do not, in principle, learn in school because it's kind of simple. But it's very important. Why can I add this equation to this one? Exactly, because they are one and the same thing. If I add something to the left and something to the right, the balance is the same, yeah? It doesn't change anything. You can always add one and one here, one here, they're still in balance. So here, I add four to the right side, and on the left side, I add something which is the same as four. So I'm practically adding two same things to the same side, to, 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 to left and the same thing to the right, because four equals this. Therefore, I'm just keeping the balance. And when you think about this, about algebra, it's, it's a very different idea than when you just learn how to solve it. You now know why, why we can do that. Just keep the scales in mind. Of course, it's not always good to keep uh, um, real objects in mind because sometimes you will have, have solutions which do not correspond to reality. But sometimes uh, for simple cases, it's good to start thinking in this way. Okay. But now let's just quickly jump 2,000 years after. So for 2,000 years, what are totally defined with logic? This was it. That was the truth. That was the state of the art for 2,000 years. Crazy. Final solution for logic. But then in the uh, 18th century, there's something started happening. And uh, this happened with Leibniz. But this, uh, this was not really uh, recognized. It was buried in his research. His idea was that you could treat these statements in logic like those in algebra. So if one statement is A and another B, if we can say that A equals B, this corresponds to saying that two things are identical if everything that can be said of the one can also be said of the other. And this is known as the Leibniz law. And now this sounds okay. What's a big deal? But he says, okay, this has certain uh, implications. Uh, and this is not only A equals B. So if all A's are B's, this, this means that all B's are also A's. So there's a relation from left to right to right, right, right to left. For example, all bachelors are unmarried men, and all unmarried men are bachelors. And now, because of this equality, what we just said, because of these scales, now whenever you see A, you can just replace it with B. Treat them the same, yeah? And this allows us to produce some truthful sentences. For example, if unmarried men equals bachelor, if they are really the same, then you can say Socrates is unmarried man or Socrates is a bachelor. And you can make an infinite a number of, of, of true sentences with this form. But this is not, this is just the first step what Leibniz did. Then he actually provided us with four laws. He added to equal more words, he added the words and then and not. And let's check, check out these laws. So A equals A, Socrates, Socrates. The second one says all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is a mortal. This is what we've seen with the Aristotle syllogism. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. But this is also something which you know from mathematics too. And then the third one, law of negation, it says A equals not not A. So if Socrates is mortal, then Socrates is not immortal. So if you negate something twice, it becomes what it was originally. Yeah? Yeah, I don't want to go into detail. It's not that crucial. The, the elementary idea is crucial. And another very important thing that, that he introduced, and this was very controversial, and it's one of the most important techniques in logic, how to prove things, if they are true or false. So he called this reductio ad absurdum. So practically what you do, instead of trying to prove that something is true, so you want to prove something is true, and you cannot do it. It doesn't work. You're trying, you're mixing, uh, you're juggling with symbols, making equations, it doesn't work. What you can instead try to, to do is you assume that it's false. And then you follow these laws of reasoning to prove that it's false. And if in proving that it's false, you get to a contradiction, this means that you were right the whole time. So if you assume the opposite, 
try to prove it and get a contradiction, this is the same as proving the original thing. So it's kind of very weird types of reasoning. So here's an example. So an, uh, a detective is, is inspecting a guy. He says, where were you on the night of the 25th? He says, I, don't, uh, I didn't do the robbery. Um, I was playing basketball. And then he says, OK, maybe that's true. Let's see if it could be true. So he calls his doctor. He says, could this guy have been playing basketball on the 25th? So he assumes the opposite, that he is right. And the doctor says, no way. He has broken his arm the day before. So he sell, tells him, you know, it appears that you have a broken arm. And you said that you didn't do it. And he said, so what? So he says, so you could not have been playing basketball with a broken arm. This is a contradiction, you see. Because he, let, he assumed the opposite. He says, OK, you are right. Let's follow that you are right. And he assumed that this could not be possible, because this would be a contradiction. He cannot be playing basketball with a broken arm. Therefore, he did the robbery. You see what he did there? It's a subtle thing. We are now used to th things like that. But this was at the time like, wow, this was a crazy idea. OK, now we have another interesting thing with logic, which happens in the 19th century. People said, OK, we can analyze sentences and then say, this is predicate, this is subject, and whatever. Another important guy was Gottlob Frege. And uh, instead of concentrating on a single proposition and its parts, like here on the left, subject and predicate, he says, let's try to determine the truth of complex propositions. This mean, means propositions which consist of more propositions joined together with connectives. And you see uh, what connectives and qualifiers are. For, so he introduced qualifiers, for example, words like all, some, for example, all men, some men, or uh, logical connectives, which are words like and, or, if, then, not. He introduced them and he says, OK, now we have a whole proposition, like one on the left, Aristotle, uh, Socrates is mortal. And let's combine these with these uh, connectives and quantifiers. And we, let's try to, uh, to create more complex propositions. So how did he do it? How does this work? So basic structure is that these sim symbols that we have, they represent statements. So instead of now saying Socrates equals A, now we say the whole sentence is P or A, or B, or I have an umbrella, it's Q. So any sentence which consists of subject and predicate, now it's a symbol. So we have two statements, it's raining and I have an umbrella. And this sentence, this is a certain linguistic form, and this form expresses something about the world. So this sentence does not have truth inside of itself. It's a form that asserts that there is a possibility of having some state of the world. So the, the idea of logic is that it, it, it offers a mechanism or a model that it can evaluate these statements according to the possibilities which they offer. So these sentences give you some possibilities, and logic teaches you how, what are they and how you can respond to them. So logic creates a so-called logical reality for each statement in log For each statement you introduce into logic, logic will give you a logical reality And you can determine how they fit, how these logical realities fit to the given possibilities. And in this classical logic, all statements have two options to respond to this logical reality. Either they match the reality which they are confronted to, which makes this sentence true statements, or they do not match this reality, which makes them false sentences. So logic, what it does in a more abstract way, it creates all possible logical outcomes or all possible logical realities for any statement and for any group of statements. And then we question these statements uh, by answering whether they match the logical reality or not. So in this respect, all of them are true or false. So now let's go to an example so not to go too abstract. We had these two sentences. It's raining and I have an umbrella. This is what we are going to work with now. So let's see what does this how logic works with this sentence, it is raining. So for, for logic, it is raining. It is a kind of st 
statement. And when you give this statement to a logic, logic gives you two options. It constructs two, two realities, two binary realities. One, you can now imagine from this sentence, this sentence you don't know if it's true or false, yeah? In order to tell if this sentence is true or false, you need two realities. You have one reality in which it is raining, and then you have a reality where it is not raining. And then if you confront this sentence, it is raining with the first logical reality where it is raining, then you're saying the truth. So outside is raining and you say it is raining, you're saying the truth. If outside is not raining, this is the second logical reality, then the sentence it is raining is false. It's not, it's not saying the truth. So these are two possible values that you can respond. And this is how you can represent it. So each statement P, whatever it is, can have two possibilities of answering to logical realities. Either it will be true or false. Now let's see what happens when you have multiple sentences. This is uh, kind of interesting. Now we have two sentences, two propositions, P, it is raining, and Q, I have an umbrella. And now, as I told you, each proposition constructs two logical realities. So it's raining, so makes two. It's raining and it's not raining. Imagine now a virtual world in which it's raining and one in which it's not raining. And then for I have an umbrella, imagine a world where you have an umbrella and a world where you don't have an umbrella. So these two sentences then ca can answer to, to these four logical realities by, s by true or false. And we, if we combine two sentences, for example, we combine sentences, it's raining and I have an umbrella into one, so this is now one sentence. Then we get four logical realities. It's raining and I have an umbrella, it's raining and I don't have an umbrella, it is not raining and I have an umbrella, and it is not raining and I don't have an umbrella. So these are po possible, possible worlds that logic creates for us that we can respond to. It looks like this. So all four possible combinations. You get this so far. Is it okay? Good. And now, not only logic uh, gives us, si uh, pro uh, provides us with these systems of statements, also gives us kind of a construction kit to compose additional realities by combining these propositions. Uh, interesting thing is that these operators, they are really mu very much inspired by language and our perception uh, of this can appear that this is kind of natural what we are doing here, here. But keep in mind, logic is not the reality, although this is a very long and complicated question, but uh, all compositions made by logic just give you rules of how to proceed from original statement to the next. So these operators that we introduced, for example, not, they operate on statements and change the statements. And by changing them, they make a contract between this change and these rules of reasoning. And this negation, it changes uh, the statement in a way which also is inspired by language. Uh, it kind of makes it opposite than what it was before. But this change actually means that the rules exist how to do this thing. So it's kind of, in a way, it's inspired by the world, but on the other way, maybe it inspires the world. So for the case of statement, it is raining, now we can put not in front and we can say this is the same as saying it is not raining. So from a sentence it is raining, now we have it is not raining. And we, if we compare it uh, with these two logical realities, it is raining and it is not raining, then we see that now the first statement, it is, uh, the, the, the statement it is not raining, when uh, uh, evaluated with the logical reality it is raining, now it's false and the other one is true. And it used to be the other way around. It used to be the first one is true and the other one is false. So what this negation does, it just inverts the truth value. If something used to be true, now it's false. If it used to be false, now it's true. And now let's go to some very interesting cases actually in logic. It's called a disjunction. It in disjunction introduces this operator or. And for that, you need to have two statements, minimum of two statements. It doesn't work with one like negation. And let's see how this works. So this or, also kind of mimics what we have in language. So imagine a situation in life that you have an apple in one hand and banana in another, and you wanna give it to a person, and you do not have a language. And you want to express thing 
that I will give you either this one or this one. And if you imagine doing that, it's super complicated to do this without a language. How to explain that you can have this, but not this, or this, but not this. It's a very abstract thing going on. Very complicated game. And this whole complexity just goes away with the word or. We take the word or for granted, but imagine what complexity does it deals with. You can have this, but not this. Or you can have this, but not this. One word, or. So you can see it's really difficult to see this boundary between language and logic. It's a very useful construct. Yeah. So let's see how th this works. So now we have a sentence which is made of two sentences. One is P, it is raining. Q is someone is watering plants. Since it is raining has two logical realities and someone is watering the plants also has two, this means that we get four in total, four logical realities. And let's see what they are. So imagine now virtual realities or real, it doesn't even matter. It, I will, that's why I call them logical realities. In one, it is raining and someone is watering the plants. In another one, it is raining and no one is watering the plants. In another one, it is not raining and still someone waters the plants. And in another one, it's not raining and no one is watering plants. And now let's see how our first sentence, it is raining or someone is watering the plants, corresponds to each of these logical realities. So if it's outside, if it's raining, and someone waters the plants, then if I say it is raining or someone is watering plants, am I saying the truth or not? So imagine what's happening in first sent in, in the sentence number one, and then say, am I saying the truth if I say it is raining or someone is watering the plants? I would say that you are saying the truth, the truth. It corresponds to that. So I'm saying it is raining or someone is watering the plants, which corresponds to this reality. In this reality, it is raining and someone waters the plants. In another one, it is raining, but no one waters the plants. I'm also saying the truth because I'm not saying that both of these are happening. I'm saying either one is happening or the other. If I say it is not raining and someone is watering the plants, I'm still telling the truth. But in the last case, there is no rain and no one is there watering the plants. If I say it is raining or someone is watering plants, I'm obviously not telling you the truth. So this complicated situation now can be made put in a table like this. So you can either, yeah? That's great, and I, I really like that, that you asked this question because this is actually what I extract from you. Just when you don't get something or you think it's wrong, just say it. Uh, so the thing is, in reality, many complex things can happen. You can have, you know, what happens in quantum physics that things, uh, are, you know, uh, are in superposition. You cannot determine if they are happening or not. So in, in the world, what we have can be very complex. Logic simplifies that. So logic says, you know, I need to decide whether this is true or not. So in the same way, it is inspired by reality, but also models reality back. If, so logic, what logic says is, we will make it that if first sentence is true and the second one is true, the conclusion is also true. So in other way, it's not that we are really describing the reality. It's logic has to choose one of them. And you can either argue that uh, maybe it shouldn't or maybe it should, but most of the mathematicians agreed that that this is, uh, that they would rather have it like this. So logic in a way models the world. It's not the right modeling. It's just, this is what logic offers. So it's both inspired by it and both inspiring it. I don't know if I answered it right, but you can then create your own logic in which uh, this first sentence would be false if the both are true. And let's now see what happens if we have a connective end. This is called conjunction, logical conjunction. So now we have both the same sentences, but instead of or, we have and in between. And this is one complex proposition. It says it is raining and someone is watering the plants. Now we have that sentence and we have the same four logical realities, actually not the same. In these four logical realities, yeah, they're the same, like we had before. 
but what is different is this and instead of or. So now imagine these four realities that you have. It is raining and someone waters the plants. It is raining and no one waters the plants, so on. If I say to you who are in the first logical reality, if I say to you, it is raining and someone is watering plants, I'm obviously saying the truth because outside it is actually raining and someone is watering the plants. But in all other situations, for example, it's raining, but no one waters the plants. If I, told, if I told you it is raining and someone is watering the plants, I'm not telling the truth because I'm suggesting that both are happening, but only one happened. Also in the last uh, sentence, it is not raining and no one is watering the plants. I'm saying, if I say to you, it is raining and someone is watering the plants, I'm saying the complete opposite of what's happening to you. Therefore, it is false. So this is how we can think about it in terms of our world, which, which logic is not. But logic is this. Inspired by it, it gives you a model how to evaluate these things mechanically. So no matter what the first sentence and the second sentence are, if they are truth, truthful to their logical reality, you can automatically compute the outcome. You can compute that they are, if they are both truth and the end is between them, the result should be truth. This is what logic does. It, it simplifies how we can model things in the world. Maybe it simplifies them too much, but still very powerful. Imagine if you didn't have anything and now we have that. Um, now, what we can have is, it's called logical implication. So, it has two parts. If the weather is nice, then I'm sitting outside. This kind of introduces dependency. Yeah? So you have one. B, and this is if. So if this, then this. So this is the form. And uh, would you like to help me to derive what would be the rules for this? Let's pretend that I do not know the rules, or do you do not know. Maybe I really do not know. They are debatable, but can we derive this like we did the last ones together? Is it okay if we try? So, if the weather is nice, then I am sitting outside. How many sentences we have put here? You agree that it's four. So you have four logical realities. Can you tell me what's the first one? It doesn't need to be in correct order. Doesn't matter. Okay. So first logical reality, imagine this happening. The weather is nice. I'm sitting outside. Imagine yourself being in this position. Okay, second one. Someone else? The weather is not nice, then I'm not supposed to be outside. Okay. The weather. I'll put that as the last one. The weather is not nice. I'm sitting outside. I'm not sitting outside. Someone else? The weather is not nice. I am sitting outside. And the last one. Okay, four realities. And this is, so you live in these four realities. I'm coming to you and I'm saying to you, let's call this P, let's call this Q, Q. yeah? And this one. 
p implies q. These are the logical realities. So, first one, the weather is nice. True. The weather is nice. True. The weather is not nice. False. The weather is not nice. False. Second one, I'm sitting outside. True. I'm not sitting outside. False. I'm sitting outside. True. I am not sitting outside. False. It's good. We have all possible combinations. T, 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 F, F, T, F, F. Okay, so I now come to you and I say, if the weather is nice, so outside is nice and you sit outside and I come to you and I say, maybe it's not, it's not the best if I, let's say that you are sitting out, you are doing this and then you are saying to someone else, for example, you are talking over a phone and you say to someone, if the weather is nice, then I'm sitting outside. In this context, are you tell telling the truth? No. Yeah? Can you elaborate? Uh, the first one, like, uh, if you are outside and you don't sit well, it's just true. <laughs> okay. And then, weather is not nice, outside is raining, you are sitting, you are in the rain. No, weather is nice, but you are inside. And you are phoning someone and saying, if the weather is nice, then I'm sitting outside. Are you saying the truth? No, because you are saying to someone that if the weather is nice, I will be outside. But actually, you are not sitting outside, so it's false. So you're not telling the truth. Okay, this one is complicated. Let's do the last one. The weather is not nice, and I'm not sitting outside. Yeah, because I, I told you, if the weather is nice, then I'm sitting outside. It's not nice, and I'm not sitting, therefore, true. This one is complicated. This is just to show you that logic does not always match reality perfectly. So, but for some of you, it might be true. Some of you might, you might be false. So, weather is not nice. It's raining, and I'm still outside. And I tell you, if the weather is nice, then I'm sitting outside. Am I telling the truth or not? Can you elaborate why true? Because, well, you, if the weather is nice, you only imply if the weather is nice. If it's not nice, you can't really elaborate on that. Yeah. Exactly. So this is depending of what you want to have because you only said if the weather is nice i'm sitting outside and you never said what happens if the weather is not nice this is what you need to imply here so therefore this statement can be both true and false and then this branches logic into two different fields it, it, uh, not, not branches logic it branches um, uh, implication into two forms of implication in one in which is this is true and in one in which this is false so you cannot decide but you have to therefore we will have two types of implications. In one, it can be true. In one, it can be false. So you will have two such tables, one with true and one with false. Yeah? Would this be the case for the main class sentence as well? Where there's not nice, I'm not sitting outside. The, yes. In our world, it would be, because you would then say, I'm reasoning about the world, and therefore, because I did not tell you about that option, uh, I do not have to define it. But in logic, Logic is not the reality. Logic needs values here. Logic needs to define what, what this thing is about. So it does not mirror the world uh, perfectly. It just, in a way, model it in a way how we agree to model it. You see, it's not perfect. And that, that is an unsettling thing. That's when, when uh, some people try to, to base whole world and reasoning on logic, many times it does not work because you have things which are undecidable. And this is actually where we will talk about quantum theory, because quantum theory says it is okay that things are undecidable, we can still work them out. But with logic, it's very complicated. Because logic is rigid. Logic is exactly this, telling you what to do. If it's this and this, what to do? Do this. If this is the first, this is second, what do you do? You do this. Yeah, it, it's used to model the world, to do something in the world to derive, to, to, uh, 
to decide what to say next, to decide how in court to defend someone, you know? It's, use, it's useful, but it's limited. But I don't want to go to limits now. Let's first do not break it immediately as I introduce it. Then what was discovered later is that these logical connectives, these little simple words like and, or, if, then are super powerful, super complicated. And then some of them, if put in a certain way, can be made uh, equal. For example, it is the same to say if P then Q, it is the same to say not P and not Q. So you can say the same thing with if and then and with double not and and. So for example, if you are a bird, then you have wings is logically equivalent to say to saying you cannot be a bird and not have wings. It says the same truth about the world according to logic. So you see these co connectives, even though they are quite different, they can be made equal. And this is not the only uh, equivalence that exists, but I'm just giving you one. And then 19th century and 20th century introduced more complex logics. For example, model logic introduces more mo lo uh, model operators. For example, necessity and contingency, and this makes it even more complicated and uh, even more uncertainty, let's say. So for example, here, when you have so what model operators are about, um, it introduces certain logical dependence between things that are possible and things that are necessary. For example, it is possible that it will rain today if and only if it is not necessary that it will not rain today. Or it is necessary that it will rain today if and only if it is not possible that it will not rain today. So it makes it very complicated. And for you, this is not necessary now to know these details. I just want that you have an idea what is this about. If someone asks you what is log model logic, you say, okay, I heard something about it. It has to do with this possible and, and uh, necessary, for example. Or if you want to know more, you will find it. And now this Frege guy, he introduced this prepositional logic where you say P is one sentence. So it's not longer subject and predicate, but P is a whole sentence, and Q is a whole sentence, and then you add and, or, and all these things. But what his, re what his goal was, what his main goal was of his career, he wanted to ground all mathematics. And mathematics means art of learning, if you go by words, mathema. That what can be learned. He wanted to ground all mathematics on logic. He wanted to build the whole image of the world, all formalities of the world, all calculations based on logic, on these basic logic ideas. But he did not know how to do that. You cannot do it just with this propositional calculus that you have. And lucky for him, there was a theory emerging at that time uh, uh, by a German mathematician, uh, Cantor, which is called set theory. And sets, they are collections of objects. And the main idea, main concept, when we talk about sets of objects, is the idea of membership. So what we are interested in, in set theory, is whether a certain object is a member of a certain set. For example, is black object here member of A or member of B or both of them or whatever? And now, interesting thing is that with these drawings here, this is how in set theory you can draw things. Now look at these three drawings. They have something to do with language, which is maybe not obvious. So now we will connect these drawings with words such as and, or, and not. For example, let's look at the first drawing. If we speak about the common elements of sets A and B, we can use the connective and to describe it. For example, we can describe the black circles in the first drawing. So black circles belong to both A, to both a and B. So black are, belong to both A and B. You see and? Now look at the second one. We now can describe these black circles as belonging to A or B. So they belong to A or they belong to B, yeah? And the third one, now we can describe black elements as belonging to B, but not to A. So this logical, he was super happy to realize that these logical connectives correspond to a set theory, and set theory is a mathematical theory. 
And set theory, unlike these, his uh, propositional calculus, set theory can talk about numbers. So he will, he will be able finally to build all theories based on logic. So, and now you can ask me, how does this set theory here, how does this correspond to numbers? How does this express numbers such as one, two, three, or five, or one million? So do you have any idea how this might correspond to numbers? Yeah, just be free to, to say whatever it's on your mind. I'm not gonna <laughs> judge any of your answers. Yes, but it's more simple than that. The idea of a set is that you have certain objects and the only property of set is cardinality and there is also ordinality, which is how they are ordered. But cardinality practically asks how many elements we have in the set. And what is how many? What's the answer to how many? A number, five, 10. So in the same time, you can work with set theory to connect language and or and not and you can use it to express numbers, which and numbers describe how many objects are there in the set. For example, this set has four objects. This set has 1,000 objects. This set and this set have 2,000 objects. You see, now we are connecting everything together. Apparently, this is what, con uh, what uh, Frege taught, that we are now connecting language, mathematics, and logic in one theory, one grand theory that's gonna explain the whole world. Just imagine this excitement on his behalf. So he said, with this, I'm gonna build the ultimate basis of all mathematics, therefore or s all science. I'm gonna make a secure foundation based on logic. Okay, we talked about geometry, uh, logic. Now let's revise what's, the, with ge what's with geometry. I have seven more slides for today, six. So. In the beginning, I introduced you with two pillars of, of rational uh, thought, and now we have geometry. And in a similar way that we had Aristotle important for logic, now the most important work in geometry for 2,000 years was the work of Euclid called Elements, still the most famous geometrical book of all times. And after him, we call geometry Euclidean geometry. And the interesting thing about this geometry was that we always thought of it as a kind of deductive theory. We defined the word deductive upon this theory. What does this mean? So at the outset of this theory, introdu uh, Euclid introduced some important statements, and today we call these statements axioms or postulates. So you take these axioms as postulates as necessary truths. If you s assume that they are truth, uh, from them, you can deduce all truths of geometry. So the most important are these five postulates, and the idea of them, what, what was his idea? Maybe it was not his idea, but this is how it's read today, is that these, element, these kind of uh, postulates are kind of self-evident. No sane person could doubt it. Or you could, if you doubt that what is said there, you can only be crazy, because this is kind of self-evident. You know, it's, it's everything around us. And this is also an interesting thing, how mathematics uh, came to develop. We'll talk about that next time. But at that time, there was no real, in geometry, there was no real distinction between what is a theory and what is reality. It's kind of both at the same time. You cannot, you know, a straight line can be made by joining any two points. When you think about it, of course, we're now in 21st century, but you know, how can you say that that's not true? It's kind of obvious, yeah? So, we see it to be true, you know? We imagine it to be true. And now, from this, he builds a network of statements, like this is a root, and he builds a whole tree. And all the statements, all the theorems, they originate from these five and some, some others. And this is what made geometry a rational science. So it's not anymore opinion-based science. You can prove, if you want to say something, the two circles will uh, um, intersect each other. You can prove it. You cannot only say it, you can prove it from this by following that. So it's similar to logic. You know, you have A and B, and then you have A and B. So you compute the, the, the answer. Also here, you start from postulates, apply logic, one statement and then one from the other, 
and then third will necessarily follow by using logic. So you see, ge geometry and logic were also very much intertwined. And this, for the first time, creates a deductive theory. The theory where you deduce from, from some roots and go further and make a tree. Yeah? Well, everything was fine until 19th century. No one doubted that what Euclid's was that Euclid's method had any fault, faults. And then 19th century, a lot of knowledge. You have a lot of knowledge accumulated. And it's not very much related. It was a kind of quite a mess. And scientists thought, you know, it would be a great idea if we can have something like Euclid's system and we introduce it to all scientists, so to all sciences like that, like simple uh, propositions and then derive our truths. And especially we need to do this in mathematics because if you do it in mathematics, then we can really secure the foundations of mathematics. We can really trace where does each mathematical formula comes from and everything is kind of a tree, perfect tree where we can see what, what came from what and so forth. But in doing so, it became really apparent that this logical apparatus of the Euclidean geometry is not really without any faults. So what they try to do mathematicians is to create this, to, to separate the deductive part of, geo, of Euclid's theory. So to separate this part where you, where you start from one sentence and go to the next one, separate it from geometrical content. So separate logical and geometrical content. And then this created a whole mess of things. So, First, it was apparent that if we simply accepted Euclid's five postulates, we cannot justify why these five sentences, why these five sent, uh, statements. The only thing which gives us stability to speak about these five sentences is our intuition. It seems that it's like that, but we cannot prove it. It seems that it's like that because if I look at things, if I see two points, I can see that a line connects them. So I see it, therefore it's true. And mathematicians said this is not enough. It's not enough to define uh, uh, your experience to be the basis of the truth. There must be something more. This really was a crazy thing. So there was, there was a kind of logical link missing there in the logical side of things. And then this fifth sentence appeared so strange because no mathematician for, for thousands of years were able to prove that. You cannot say if this is true or false. And uh, something really strange started to happen at this point. There was a Russian mathematician called Lobachevsky. And he created so-called hyperbolic geometry. So he's very smart what he did. He took these four statements of Euclid, and she says, okay, in my geometry, we have the same four postulates as Euclid. But in my theory, fifth sentence is false. I say that fifth sentence is false. Euclid said it's true, I say it's false. And everyone was like, <laughs> what's going on? So he used the same rules of logic the same things, the same apparatus, instead, fifth sentence was said to be false. He created his own geometry, which did not look like anything that we have in our world. It was hyperbolic geometry. So two lines, parallel lines, would in fact meet in infinity. And everything else was deducted from the axioms in the same way as Euclid did, except that this geometry was not real. This geometry had nothing to do with how we observe things in reality. On the other hand, it was completely valid because he used the same logical rules. It was completely valid construction. And you can imagine that this was very distressing for many. Can we do that? The question was, if we can do this in mathematics, then what is mathematics about? And we have a quote on the right side there from a very famous mathematician called Bertrand, Bertrand, Bertrand Russell, who said, mathematics may be defined as the subject in which we never know what we are talking about, nor whether what we are saying is true. Imagine that. After 
2,000 years of having solid foundations of things, being very happy with your geometry and uh, logic, one of the most famous mathematicians says mathematics may be defined as the subject in which we never know what we are talking about nor whether what we are saying is true. A complete loss of foundations. We do not even know what's re real and what's not real anymore. We do not know how to access if something's truthful and something's not. If we can make our own geometry in a very valid way. So now the question was, and this is what we are going to speak a lot about next time. So if mathematics is not about the truths of the world, if mathematics is not about what we can see with our eyes and what we can assume, where do we find this stability that mathematics gave us for so long? Where can we find it? And now, this was reconstructed. This stability was not lost. It was just reconstructed. So it was reconstructed by shifting this necessity of mathematics from, from the truthfulness, to, from the truthfulness of these premises towards the kind of internal coherence of a system of, of premises. So it's not any more important if what you're saying is true. It's just important that it's coherent, that it follows the rules that you can trace and say, I derived, I say this because I derived it from, from, from something else. So in a way, you started getting uh, lost of, of your intuition to describe uh, a theory and started to think more about reasoning itself. So if you have a coherent reasoning to describe something, that is enough because none of them is about the world. They're all models. And this was a very, very strange situation. And this coherence that I'm talking about, this, this next level of, of addressing whether something is valid or not, this coherence was known as consistency. So the idea is consistency. And uh, so this also I'm here starting to introduce what this course, how this course will relate to architectural uh, models. Uh, there were two schools, if I simplify things, that are interested in how to deal with this consistency now, how to establish consistency. And first, I, well, first school on the left, I call it logicist tradition. And their uh, approach was to establish kind of a unified system of foundations, uh, like a little, uh, like a root. And you define all mathematics bottom up from this unified system of foundations. So there is a unified system for everything. And from that, you, you, you build up from bottom up everything uh, uh, on top of it. So you can think of it as a tree, and this tree has a root, trunk, and branches. And on the root, these guys try to put uh, formal logic. So you see Frege, Russell, Whitehead, we have some important names. And second school of thought, I named it algebraist tradition. And their approach was to think of abstraction, so to use abstraction as a way to create internally coherent frameworks. So frameworks which are co coherent, but do not have this unified system. And what seemed unappealing to many at that time was that these frameworks, which are created through abstraction, they're not necessary nor absolute anymore. They're kind of contingent things, not necessary. They, but on the same, uh, at the same time, they allow you to create uh, objectivity locally without a unified basis. So they do not get rid of the postulates like the one we had uh, with uh, Euclid, but now we do not see these postulates as truths anymore. They're not absolute anymore. So these postulates that we can have for, for geometry, for example, five postulates of Euclid and five postulates of Lobachevsky, they can be valid in one system, in one model, and not valid in another. So you kind of have plura plurality of models. So you cannot think of it as a tree where you have unified foundations and everything built up. It's more like strange, messy gardens with kind of things appearing everywhere. Yeah? So it's not a unified thing. It's disconnected, but coherent. And what do you think which of these schools became more prominent in the next 100 years? If you don't know it, it's OK. But do you have an idea what became more prominent? I would say, uh, unfortunately, not. Although, yes, to write, today we live in a world which create models from the right side. The left side was super appealing to people. Even when you go to CERN today and you see this quest for the 
ultimate particle that will explain how the world works. There is this still wish for us to have one core and from this core to, to derive the whole world. So this logistics tradition was very important. People w still didn't want to give up idea that everything must be connected and sprouting from one little cause, you know? But the problem is what I discovered with doing my PhD for a long time and generally doing research is that how this affected computation and computers. Uh, because in many branches of knowledge, we tend to think about computation and computers as coming from the left side, logistics tradition. And if you think about computation from the left side, you will see later, I will explain in detail, you always think about limits of computation. What is the limit of computation? And especially this is true with architectural modeling. If you think about computers from the left perspective, you are kind of stuck. You cannot go further. And uh, I will not go further there, but this was an important part of uh, my PhD. And then uh, this search for consistency kind of expanded towards something else, which is called axiomatics or proof theory. And I will read uh, 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 you a quote here. If geometry is to become a genuine deductive science, it is essential that the way in which I inferences are made, so how, how do we de deduct, how inf inferences are made should be altogether independent of the meaning of the geometrical concepts, but also of the diagrams. And uh, in his uh, book called Axiomatics, a uh, mathematician called Robert Blanchet, he introduces uh, fundamental conditions uh, which you must have in a deductive theory in order to be rigorous. And he says, you need to have explicit enumeration of the primitive terms for subsequent using definitions, explicit enumeration of the primitive propositions, stuff like that. Relations between the primitive terms shall be purely logical relations, independent of any concrete meaning which may be given to terms. So you see clear separation of what is logical or what is uh, deductive and what is content. So separating logical content from, for example, geometrical content. And then he says, these relations alone shall occur in the demonstrations and independently of the meaning of the terms so related. So what's the point of this? Point of this is that mathematicians today still use proofs. They, they are the basis of, this, of, of, of determining whether some theory is valid or not, some mathematical uh, theory. And, uh, but mathematical proof is not the same as, as following, for example, propositional logic. And this is what I want to, to show you. For example, if you have a system of postulates, this is more like a system of equations with several uh, unknowns. And these unknowns, they are primitive terms with which, which we construct axioms. Uh, and when you put it like this, when you, when you say, when you make an algebra, algebraization of this primitive statement, um, they, they are not longer in the domain of being just true and false because they contain relatively indeterminate uh, variables. Only when we give some real values to these, to these uh, variables, only when then uh, we can say, for example, x is two, then we get logic. So if we say x is two, then y will immediately be two x or two times two four, then we have particular theory. For example, particular geometry or particular uh, logic. But before that, how mathem mathematics or proof theory works is it kind of leaves these things to be indeterminate. So these variables that it deals with uh, do not have value uh, specified yet. So it kind of deals as this value is not longer specified. And this way it's a kind of more open system than, than lo system of logic. So depending on how you make these variables into constants, this depends of what then uh, comes truth, uh, truth and falsity. And I will give you an example uh, of what this means in a system called Piano's axiomatic system. This is an example of kind of systematic ambiguity that you have in uh, mathematics when dealing with, with proofs. Look at this definition of, uh, uh, of, of uh, arithmetics. So he said, you have three primitive terms here, zero, number, and successor. And then you have five primitive propositions. Zero is a number. The successor of a number is a number. Different numbers do not have the same successor. Zero is not the successor of any number. 
sorry, if a property belongs to zero and if when it belongs to a given number, it belongs also to the successor of that number, then it belongs to all numbers, yeah? And on basis of these five sentences, the same way as with Euclid, we can now uh, derive all arithmetics. Everything involves involving uh, natural numbers, yeah? But in a very different way than, uh, than it was done with Euclid. Because you can imagine that this thing is not only about numbers. They can be other systems which would also satisfy this criteria. For example, we can replace zero with a hundred and say hundred is a number. This system will still work, but instead of zero, we will have hundred. Yeah? So it's um, ambiguous. It's not clear. What, it's not a specified thing like, like, like in geometry when you say line is in between two things. Yeah? Many other, this, so what is important here is this kind of formal structure and uh, kind of structure of progressions which defines what numbers arithmetics is about, but without defining it closely by leaving space that other things can be that too. Yeah? And then the search for consistency, this is the last slide, the search for consistency uh, that I show you now in order so to replace the truthfulness of, of uh, elementary propositions towards this consistency of the whole system. This was not exclusive to mathematics. It became very important in philosophy too in the early 20th century. This time, now the basis of argumentation was not mathematics, but language. And I give you two examples here. On the left, we have uh, Wittgenstein saying, early Wittgenstein saying, um, what can be said at all can be said clearly and whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. So he kind of defined what can be said philosophically, yeah? So what he suggests is that all problems in philosophy, they actually originate from the inconsistent use of language. So what he suggests to have, what we need, is kind of philosophical grammar, which could be a counterpart to these postulates, but in language. And with this grammar, we could formally derive what is a valid philosophical reasoning. So what is a valid thing to say and what is not? Like we have in uh, classical grammar, what is a valid sentence and what is invalid? What is a grammatical sentence and what is gra not grammatical? He does this to, to philosophical statements, which is a super radical thinking. And the second thing is this Saussure, uh, uh, actually he's Swiss, and he started looking uh, for a si formal symbolic way to address language. So he says, the concepts are purely, purely differential and defined, not by their positive content, but negatively by their relations with the other terms of the system. Their most precise characteristics is being what the others are not. So he defines the thing not as the thing, but as not the other things. Also very radical uh, thing. And in, in this way, he was also being able to deal with, with the language kind of for, uh, symbolically. So it's not about the meaning, and it's about uh, relations of symbols within a context. Yeah, so that was it uh, from the lecture. Ne then we will continue next time. I just wanted to introduce very elementary things, because as you will see, these very simple ideas will extend to everything, to computation, to development of science, mathematics, probability theory, uh, quantum theory, and everything. But we need to have a kind of this background. Also, it will be important for you to understand where the computers fit in in the story and what are the limitations of, of our kind of our thinking, of our language, of what can be expressed with computers, of what can be expressed formally, and so on. And I think you as an architect uh, would be more powerful to express your ideas if you, if you know the context, if you know this large context, you will then know uh, where you are situated in and where you can where you can go further. So now, if you have some questions, it's a good uh, will be. You can ask now. Um, okay. I'm not sure exactly uh, which. Is it 
this one. Yeah. Yeah, so imagine a very abstract way. So Cantor, um, Georg Cantor is a German mathematician, 19th century, 1960 something. He makes the first paper and with the paper, he creates a new theory. <coughs> and he says, in my theory, which will be a basis of uh, kind of um, uh, uh, it would be a grounding system of mathematics on it. Uh, the how he wants to build foundations of mathematics is with set theory. So he describes a theory in which uh, objects, uh, which you have two things. You have sets and you have objects. Sets are collections of objects, but objects can be anything. You do not na need to name what object is. It can be flowers, it can be, you know, whatever. You need to say that this is an object and uh, sets have certain number of objects. Then he later expanded his theory, you can have finite sets or infinite sets. And this is actually where it broke, where his theory got broken with actually infinite sets and sets which contain themselves and stuff like that. But the idea of set theory is that you have two properties, ordin uh, cardinality, which is the only property of set is how many elements it has. And this is how he defines numbers. For example, uh, yeah, you, you can define natural numbers as sets of with one element. One would be all sets with one element of any things in the, wor in the world. Two would be every possible combi objects which are two. You know, so it's not two, two of these, it's any two things, you know? So set does not care what is the content. It's, it cares what, uh, it cares that you can actually uh, recognize one from the other <coughs> and then you can have two things. And then he defines three as three things, what, whatever three things they are. And so on, with infinite set, you can define whole uh, as an, a number, number system. And then how you operate with uh, s sets is you, you make a so-called hierarchy of sets. You can have sets of sets and sets of sets of sets and stuff like that. So this is how you model. But the idea here is that set theory, so now I show you how it corresponds to numbers because it corresponds to numbers by having uh, certain amount of things and also or, uh, there's a property called ordinality which defines if sets are ordered if things are ordered one comes first or the other but that's secondary key and the another thing is that with set you can think about uh, logical uh, uh, operators for example if you have these objects here and you have two sets a and b if sets a and b are superimposed on these objects there you can speak about these two objects here as being in A and in B, members of A and B. So a logical statement A and B in set theory would be modeled like this, union of two sets. So objects which belong both to A and to B. Here you would say in the second one, black objects are described as objects which are A or B. So every one of these blacks can be said, oh, this is either A or B, yeah? This would be the truth, truthful statement. And the other one, you can say which are objects uh, are part of B or objects which are not part of A, for example. Not A, so this would be a negation. Maybe it doesn't, B is not necessary here. You can just say what is not A, all of the black ones. So in a way, set theory looks like at that time that is able to connect numbers by speaking about uh, the size of the sets, to connect logics by speaking about logical propositions like and or not, uh, 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 not propositions, logical operators like and or not, and at the same time uh, uh, speak of language because these logical statements resemble what we see in the world. So in a way, it looked like something that can be a basis of everything at that time. I don't know if I answered, but Someone else? This one. You know in grammar uh, how we speak, if I say uh, my name is Nicola, 
we would consider that to be grammatical sentence because there are rules which can we derive certain rules we, which we describe that this is a, would a, be a valid sentence but if i say i nicola m or something like that we would say yeah this is not a valid sentence Gram this is ungrammatical sentence it does not follow the rules that we devise in language but uh so we are kind of we learn to, to speak about language in this way, about what is valid and what is not. It's always difficult for me when I speak something like that. I know already the limitations of what I'm saying, but I need to tell you how people thought at that time. There are also limitations of grammar, because in poetry, sometimes things are ungrammatical, but they are beautiful, or they convey something which is not grammatical, but still makes sense to us, still inspires us, or see, still is meaningful, although it's not grammatical. And uh, early Wittgenstein was more interested in this idea of what is valid and what is not. And for him, grammar was a good example. But he tried to extend grammar, not to be only saying what is grammatical sentence, what is a grammatical sentence, but what is, what is valid philosophical statement and what is invalid philosophical statement. So he started like to cut through philosophy of history and say, yeah, I, I want to make a system uh, of philosophy which would be able to determine what is a nonsense or what is a meaningful uh, uh, philosophical thing to say and you see how 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 uh, impressively uh, sharp he is there he says what can be said at all can be said clearly and whereof one cannot speak thereof one must be silent there, so there is clearly a separation of what can be said and what cannot be said in philosophy he draws a line and uh, this book is very impressive. I suggest that you look at it. You don't have to read it. You just look at it and see how crazy it is. This uh, tra Tractatus Log Logico Philosophicus. And uh, late Wittgenstein, of course, will will uh, will understand that he was not really, not that he was not right, but he will have an alternative view to to what language is about and everything. But early Wittgenstein is very sharp. So he makes a, his book has kind of seven statements and uh, seven sentences and then in each seven sentences they start branching out so there is sentence one then sentence 1.1 1. 1. and then uh, this the, mo the first level of hierarchy are the most important sentences then the second is more impo uh, less important 1.1 1. 1. then 1.1.1 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. so he starts branching and he makes the whole system in one book of 50 pages but you have a look at that it's very interesting of course you will not understand anything no one will Everyone claims that someone does understand, but it's like, it's a very impressive uh, book, which is so co complex and so incredibly sharp that it's really en enjoying just to, just to read through it, even if you do not get it. And you can find it for free. You can find it uh, online. Just type it, you'll get the PDF. Some, something else or we finish for today I also said that I do not want to keep you uh, full two hours I want to because I would for me it would be more important that if you can just if you find it interesting just to ask a question whatever it is maybe we can discuss it together I'm also you know I'm an architect and I just took a lot of time to to get to know these things because I found they are important but I also have very limited knowledge if you ask me about uh, uh, mathematics or language that's why I uh, do not be intimidated. You know, there are no wrong or right questions. I'm just, as a, your fellow colleague, trying to uh, to share something with you that I found fascinating as an architect. Well, everything was uh, kind of happening in a similar time span. So Wittgenstein, early Wittgenstein. Um, this was the, the, you know, heard of Vienna Circle. So he was a part of the Vienna Circle and many things have uh, happened around it. 
there was also Rudolf Carnap, and then they started branching of uh, what, what is the re relation between logic and the world uh, and language. So this was the main, main topic. And uh, Wittgenstein actually did not write very much. He uh, had very few books, and one at the very beginning when he was very young, and, and the other when he was kind of old. So, uh, and the other one, he's more interested in not in the truthfulness of language or like these images of the world, how this correspond, how uh, logic is a kind of image of the world, but more like language games. And he really, uh, out of this super rigid system, appearing to be super rigid, even this very complex system, he started playing uh, games on language, trying to, to explain things which are not grammatical. It's, yeah, but I have also limited knowledge about the, the late Wittgenstein. It's also a very big book. It's not anymore a short, powerful book. It's like huge. And That's uh, every. Uh, I mean, th that's the whole point. So none of this is true. You can make these kind of assumptions, but you need to um, imagine that they are not the truths. They are the models. If you think that they are the truths, this is pre 19th century. The people thought, yeah, what he's saying is true, and the Lobachevsky said, well, I made my own. I changed the fifth, and now we have a different hyperbolic world which none of us ever imagined. It's valid. It's not true. Truth but it's valid. So his assumptions, his, the idea is that you can have assumptions and we as humans, we never really know the truth. We are modeling it as close as we think is possible or what is, you know, we are always having different assumptions about how the world works. And it's never the world, it's always about the world. We are always modeling it and we know it's not perfect. Like I showed you with this elementary logic. But we need to have some basis to decide, you know, is my work uh, valuable or not? And they say, you know, because we cannot know if this is true or not, it, because if it is not true, we need to find another criteria. And then the criteria was, is it coherent? So what you might be saying may be not true at all, but if it's coherent, then it has some value. So within your system, then you can derive some truths and they, mean, they, may not be, they will be true uh, within your system but they do not have to be truth within my system. But what is important is, is that we know the rules of the game, that we know that both of our systems are consistent, that we, what we started with and where we ended with. And then we can talk, then we can find value in, uh, in each other's work. Yeah? Even though it's not true. Even though it's assumption. Yeah, and this was also what it was the stake with, uh, with, with, with Wittgenstein. Because exactly in the language in which you speak uh, also introduces a certain modeling of the world. If I say you are this, I am this, you know, I'm not really describing you, but I'm making a model of you. And in this model, I have a very rigid model. If I say, yeah, you are something, you're smart. Um, yeah. You can define how, what does this mean. But this is one way of, of, uh, of defining things. And this is one, I would say, a very set, set theoretical way of, uh, th uh, way of describing things. By, by putting them, for example, in labels. By putting things and saying, ah, he belongs here, he belongs here, this belongs there. So that's one of way of, 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 of working with things. And this is what, what happened in the 19th century, when this idea became the basis of all mathematics. But this is not the only way how we can define things. And also, this is not the only way we can discuss. So 
I can say this thing is white, but I can say this thing is, has something to do with white. If I say it has something to do with white, I will maybe, and if you care very much that it's white, uh, if you say it's black and I say it's white, it's a clash, direct clash. Uh, also in, for example, f uh, f uh, in psychiatry, uh, what patients have with traumas have problems is uh, recognizing from, when they say I, recognizing I that speaks now and I, which had a trauma, which was traumatized when it was five years old. And these people say, I am like this. And uh, at this time they evoke what they felt when they were five years old. So they are not able to make the distinction between I uh, and uh, I 20 years ago and I now, for example. But we use the same word. So this is the way how language also defines how we behave and how we feel. What if there was a different word for me when I say I now and I 30 years ago? Then maybe I would not have this, this direct clashing. You know what I'm trying to say there? That language obviously influences the way we, we deal with the world and how we speak about things. If we say things are black and white, yes, then if you say it's black and I say it's white, we go to war. Because there's no, but nothing to talk about. We, we put the world up to logic to decide and logic says this is contradictory. So I must kill you because I want this to be white and you want this to be black so we should kill each other and who survives, this one is the winner to resolve the contradiction. In quantum physics, what we have as a modeling corresponds what we can have is also in language is that we do not have to be categorical about things. But I think what I find is that this is very difficult what is going on. We, do not, we are not there yet. I think our language is still very much set theoretical. We are really strict about argumentation and what is uh, true or not and what are the labels. They can be a different way, for example, to speak and then language would influence our world differently, perhaps. So I'm very open about these things. I, I do not see them as, yeah. But it's difficult to speak about it when you have not yet experienced what the limits of, of these systems are. And these limits, why they kind of limit also our architecture that we try to do with computers. But yeah, later we will, we will uh, speak more about it and hopefully you will have better idea. If you have more questions, you can ask or we can finish. So the only thing I would like to ask you is to put your presence on that list, or on that sheet, and that's it. I will not count the first, uh, who came to the first introduction lecture as anything. So I just want to, to remember you a little bit better. So yeah, if let's say that we are finished for today and next time, yeah, next time. We will speak about formal systems, about what computability is, what, how, what language is about, yeah, how this emerged from this story that I told you today. So thank you and see you next week.